We've got two presentations today. First off, Joanne Fitton, who I'll introduce in a minute. And then second, Kevin Wilson, um, who will give the, the second presentation. Uh, so Joanne is Deputy Director of Libraries, Museums and Galleries at the University of Liverpool. She's been there since November 2022 and she leads heritage, education and digital. She moved from University of Leeds, where she was Associate Director of Special Collections and Galleries. And she will talk about addressing the colonial, excuse me, colonial legacies in the University of Liverpool's heritage collections. And Joanne, it's over to you. Thanks, James. Right, I'll just do my screen sharing. Hope you can see that now. Okay. I'll start then. So um, today I'm going to outline some of the decolonisation activities happening at the University of Liverpool, specifically focusing on the collections based work of special collections and archives and how that relates to the broader institutional context in which we operate. So, as um, James said, I'm Joanne Fitton, Deputy Director of Lives, Museums and Galleries at Liverpool, and I joined this team in November. And so most of the work that I'm describing is the hard work of my colleagues. And unfortunately, Robin, who was meant to be presenting with me today, wasn't able to attend. Um, I also want to acknowledge Jenny Hyam. Both of these individuals have been instrumental in much of the coordination of this work to date. So, see if my slide moves on. Um, the University of Liverpool was founded in 1881 after the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. However, the history of Liverpool, its socio-economic role as an imperial city port, port city, and indeed home of Confederate embassy during the American Civil War, clearly and directly has a legacy on our collections, not least in the sense that many of the foundation collections were gifted by benefactors whose family wealth was derived from such activity. Now, Liverpool is a city and as a university began to formally acknowledge this legacy in the 2000s. In 2006, the Centre for the Study of International Slavery was established at the university. And in 2007, the International Slavery Museum, part of National Museums Liverpool, opened at the Albert Dock. Both have a local, national and international profile in research, education and outreach. It was in the late 2010s when the university, in common with other institutions, began receiving FOI requests around the link between their historical funding and the transatlantic slave trade, that the importance of the institutional archive in both researching and acknowledging these issues came to the fore. In 2020, the University Heritage Strategy was revised in light of world events and developments in the sector. And at this time, a university endowment was un unlocked for the purposes of pursuing this work on a wider scale. An advisory board was founded, which is meeting three times a year, and it includes academics, professional services staff, external stakeholders, such as from National Museums Liverpool and members of the community-based Liverpool Black History Group. Libraries, museums and galleries employed short-term posts to assess the collections in terms of their provenance and flag up areas of concern. It also facilitated a tangible partnership with the Centre for the Study of International Slavery. And community events have been held, initially focused on Toxteth and the L8, the historically black area of Liverpool, which is adjacent to the university campus. The idea behind these community events was to help determine institutional approaches whilst being mindful of the need to take a listening approach and to plan for ongoing collaboration in order to build trust. And two new posts are being funded to research the university's links to slavery and colonialism using the heritage collections. A three year postdoc is currently starting in September and a two-year research assistant post will be targeted at a wider audience to get someone on staff with relevant knowledge and lived experience who may not have followed a traditional academic path. The role is likely to start in 2024 and part of that role will be to act as a bridge to the local community. 
All this activity is underpinned by our broad collections. And this presentation focuses on the work which is going on in the library, specifically special collections and archives. The collections include manuscripts, medieval and modern, the university archive, deposited collections, including literary and political archives, over 70,000 printed books from the 15th century to the present, plus Europe's largest catalogued collection of science fiction. So the library began to explore the approach to decolonization in 2020. This was a period when decolonization in heritage received more attention in national news as a result of the Black Lives Matter protest and Cambridge University published its initial report from the Legacies of Slavery Inquiry. At this stage, the library wanted to develop its departmental approach to the legacies of slavery and colonialism as present in the professional practices and collections. Colleagues established best practice by researching literature and publications and by speaking to other archivists in UK institutions. This was found to be exceptionally helpful to hear about work taking place elsewhere and to discuss common approaches and challenges. So the focus was on three strands, collections, partnerships and staff training. And I'll introduce a few work packages that have been integrated into daily workflows in relation to collections and partnerships. A lot of the great work being done has been done by my colleagues in special collections and archives and museums and galleries, as well as independent researchers. So I'm just here reporting it. And you might say, you might hear me say we when I mean them. So I do want to acknowledge their efforts before I begin. So the first package to speak about is searching the archives catalogues for offensive or outdated language. Archival material is born out of the affairs of individuals, institutions, organizations, and businesses. It captures the relationships and daily workings between people, their lives, and their work. As such, archival material is of significant and personal importance to many. However, historical material contains language and illustrative depictions of people that are offensive and outdated. These instances may be racist, homophobic, sexist or ableist, and more broadly, a significant part of the systematic marginalisation of people throughout history. Therefore, the archivists at the University of Liverpool are currently working to identify offensive or outdated language that is used within the metadata on the dedicated archives catalogue. The purpose of this work is not to remove all instances of historic discriminatory language from the resource descriptions. This would be unhelpful in the instances where the discriminatory language provides researchers with insight into the prejudices of that particular archive collection or its creators. And I'll say a little more on this on when we would choose to retain or remove a term shortly. The approach to this work is very much influenced and directed by the work taking place in the University of Leeds Special Collections. And Robin spoke to one of the archivists there, Holly Smith, who shared their excellent work in this area. Firstly, the archivists are seeking to identify discriminatory language within the catalogue records. Our process for this involves using Carissa Chu's inclusive terminology glossary to search for the offensive terms in the back end of our archives catalogue system, EMU. Chu's work, which was undertaken on behalf of National Library of Scotland, is very helpful and it's geared towards cultural heritage professionals. Although a fantastic resource, we recognise that this glossary is not a comprehensive nor a singular authority on this topic. Once we reach various milestones in the project, we will also be engaging with various academics and knowledgeable persons to ensure our approach is respectful and inclusive to all. But it's a very good solid starting document that is recommended and there's a link to it on this slide. We have a workflow to establish what we do with the offensive term. Archivists then decide to retain the term, change the term or remove the term. Retaining the term would be the preferred option when it is necessary for the term to be transcribed exactly as is, in line with cataloging standards. So for example, the title of a report. 
In this case, we would place the offensive term in speech marks and we would add a statement to the record to specifically identify the term and to let the reader know that it is required to accurately describe the material. Changing the term is the preferred option when the term is offensive. And although the purpose of the term is required, the exact term isn't necessary. So it can be substituted for an acceptable alternative term. A statement is added to the catalogue record to confirm this correction has taken place. And I have an example of where we have done this coming up in just a moment. Lastly, removing the term is the preferred option when the term is genuinely not necessary or required for accurately describing the material. For example, previous catalogue as choice of words in the description field. In these cases, we would remove the term and add a statement to the catalogue record. All of these options include uploading and clarifying statements to be, to be clear as to what we've done to the catalogue record. And we keep a screenshot of the previous record for preservation purposes. The archivists have searched for around 280 terms and have located around 20 instances where an intervention of this nature was required. Moving forward, we'll be turning our attention to the records for printed or published material held within special collections, broadening from language in, into offensive depictions and descriptions of persons within the material, so not present or immediately obvious within the catalogue records, as well as working with experts and knowledgeable persons to ensure our approach is well informed. This work informs the current cataloguing practice of archivists and it will carry on through daily workflows in the future. So here's an example of a term that we've changed. This is a record for one of our items. It's an album of 19th century paintings from China and the original record used the term costume which is now considered to be an outdated and offensive term to describe the dress of communities of persons. So here we've substituted that term for traditional dress and we've added a statement in the description field to outline that we've edited the record. So moving on to a second piece of work, um, has been our approach to the Sinti Romanid collections. And Special Collections and Archives holds a significant collection relating to Romani families in Nazi era Germany, many of whom were murdered in the Holocaust. Last summer, our Special Collections librarian acquired a grant from the University of Liverpool's diversity and equality team. With the help of research conducted by Professor Eve Rosenhoft, who is an expert in modern German history, the archivists carefully matched the subjects of the photographs, Sinti, Roma names, and the German names that they were forced to adopt by the ruling authorities that persecuted them. The funding was used to hire one of our project archivists to update 300 catalogue records in line with the research conducted by Professor Rosenhoft. In November, we hosted some of the descendants of the survivors featured in the photographs from Germany. The visitors represented a wide group of descendants and were keen to see the photographs, but also to discuss topics such as the eth ethics of the very nature of these photographs being taken in the first place and being housed in the university. The visit was extremely emotional for the visitors several of whom are deeply impacted by intergenerational trauma. And one of the matters discussed were the steps that we had taken to enhance the biographical information in catalogue records. At the request of the visitors, the catalogue updates that we had made were removed because the living descendants felt that this was an open opportunity for persons with malicious intent to persecute the Sinti community further. We also de deaccessioned several sensitive photographs immediately at the request of the descendants, and we'll be working with them to identify further candidates for deaccession. So this particular example demonstrates the need for librarians, archivists, curators to provide time to really listen to persons whose histories are connected to our spaces and collections, and to take the necessary steps to ensure that relationships are respectful and reciprocal.
A third example is research into the um, slave trade. As Liverpool was the largest European port in the slave trade, determined by volume of slave trading ships that cleared via the docks, it's inevitable that our collections contain material that is related to the historic trade of enslaved persons, and further than this, material demonstrating the profit from goods that enslaved labour produced. We felt it was appropriate that researchers who have a specialism on the topic advised us on the exact nature of the material we hold and its significance for researchers in this field. We commissioned research to review archival and rare book and pamphlet holdings and for them to produce reports. And these have been shared with our advisory board. Moving forward, we'll be using this research to help us identify important candidates for conservation and deeper research. And we've already identified some important items which we will hope to be conserved in the coming year. And we can also focus around these significant items and collections as part of exhibitions and events in the future. So with all these different activities, what is it that we are aiming for? We want to have a deeper understanding of the links to slavery and colonialism in the collections thus supporting the university's broader efforts. And we want to properly contextualize offensive language in the catalogues. We want to have integrated equity and diversity in policies and our professional practice. And we want to be more transparent and challenge and have more transparent and challenging interpretations of material in exhibitions and events. And we think there is the opportunity for partnership, engagement and outreach with experts and persons connected to the collections. So as tends to be the nature of most complex activities, most of the points on this slide represent both successes and challenges. The securing of high level institutional support evidenced by the requirement that we have to submit a twice yearly report to the University's Heritage Arts and Culture Committee, chaired by one of our um, PVCs, has meant funding and profile the, for the work, but has also meant time and effort is required to manage expectations. Different stakeholders, both internal and external, have different ideas around the timeline and the focus of our work. And we're particularly concerned to communicate effectively with the community groups who feel they have waited a long time for acknowledgement and action from the university. Library staff working on these areas are generally undertaking tasks alongside their core role and may not be in a position to dedicate as much time to it as we would like. Even though we found that everyone agrees in principle on the value of the work, Managing it effectively may require convincing busy managers that, that the work is an institutional priority in order to achieve practical results. Although we've been able to link up with related projects, particularly in the museums, there is further work to be done in terms of join up with the work on decolonisation of reading lists and the university's race equality charter to ensure a consistent message and effort. The collections and curatorial work outlined will continue and will inform the work of the two funded research posts. However, we are mindful of the need to be flexible in our approach as the direction the research takes could require us to respond in different ways. And it could bring to light collection areas to focus on which we are not yet aware. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. That was excellent. Uh, so we'll move on now to Kevin Taylor. We'll we'll take questions after. There's there's one gone into Q and A already. Please do post them because it gives Kevin and Joanne time to look at them um, ahead of Kevin. Well, Kevin's going to be talking, but keep keep them coming. Um, Kevin Wilson is 
seconded to be one of the assistant directors at LSE Library. Um, his substantive role is academic liaison and collection development manager, and he's been with LSE since 2017, um, having been at Goldsmiths and City before that. So he's presented at a number of conferences and events. He's written book chapters and blog posts on diversifying library collections, and, and it's one of those that is the, the jumping off point for his talk to us this afternoon. So, Kevin, over to you. Okay, hopefully you can see the slides okay. Uh, so thanks very much for joining us, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to um, kind of do a bit of a, a plug for the book that I wrote the chapter for. So this presentation is is mainly based on the chapter that I contributed towards narrative expansions. It may be a book that you're familiar with. Um, so this was a book that was published in December 2021, and it's edited by Jess Crilly and Regina Everett. And this chapter really just fleshes out some of the ideas um, in that in that book chapter, but the book chapter will go into much more detail in this presentation. Um, so narrative expansions uh, really makes an important contribution to the discussion about decolonization in academic libraries. It doesn't just cover collections, it basically takes a holistic overview of all aspects of academic librarianships. That includes recruitment and career progression, cataloging, classification, and information literacy, but beyond that. Um, it also takes an international perspective and it combines theory and practice. So it takes a really wide, all encompassing view of academic librarianship. Um, if it's in your library, great. I hope it gives you a chance to think and reflect upon your processes and maybe think about ways that, that you can enact change in your institution. Uh, if not, please ask your acquisitions colleagues to buy a copy. I don't get royalties, but, uh, but hopefully it will be a book that will um, kind of help you on your own journey. Um, so the chapter that I'll be mostly focusing on is available in the LSE Institutional Repository and the um, the link is on the screen, but hopefully uh, one of the IRL UK colleagues may be able to share that in the chat. So in terms of uh, the, the summary of what this presentation will cover, there's, there's six main sections really. So the first will be the, the origins of the LSE as a social sciences institution and basically how our founding principles and our original curriculum from 1896 have basically shaped how our collections have developed over the next century or so after that. Uh, and then I'll focus on a, a collection evaluation project we finished in 2018. And the purpose of that was to evaluate our collections, identify our strengths and our weaknesses, and come up with recommendations for how we manage both aspects of that. Um, I'll follow that up with a brief summary of some collections analysis work that I've done uh, that looks at the geographical diversity of our collections. Uh, previous presentations I've done have done this in much, much more detail, but I'll, I'll just do a, a kind of a light overview of the data from that. Uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of discuss some more uh, philosophical questions, maybe about library collections. So, so tackling ideas of objectivity and bias within collection development and ask whether collection development can truly be neutral. And the spoiler is it's probably not as neutral as we, we might initially think it might be. Um, and then I'll do a, a bit of reflection on, on bias in reading lists across academic disciplines, and then kind of think about well, what are the relationships between reading lists and library collections? And really um, what is the relationship between the two? Because they both kind of feed off each other. And then, and then lastly, I'll provide some practical recommendations that you might want to think about um, and you might want to investigate further. Um, so just in terms of the history of LSE, I know most of these presentations always start with a bit of a bit of an overview of the institution, but the LSE was founded in, in 1895 by prominent members of the Fabian Society. So it's so names that you'll be familiar with. And really it was open to encourage original investigation and research into the economic and social sciences. And the original prospectus of which I've got some slides in a moment that lists uh, nine main subjects that the LSE focused on at the time. Um, and you'll see those listed. And the school's motto uh, is, is to know the causes of things and its, and its purpose is for the betterment of society. And that's really underpinned everything that the school has done in terms of teaching and research over the last century and more. And the Fabians were really uh, keen on seeing the potential of the social sciences to transform society for the better. Uh, and I think that that kind of driving principle has really shaped the way both the library is operated, but also the way that we've developed our collections as well. So I'll just kind of go through a couple of slides. You won't be able to see these without squinting in a huge amount of detail, but this is the original prospectus from 1896 of the LSE. 
and this is available in the LSE Digital Library, and it lists nine main subjects and basically the public lectures and the, the classes that are associated with those. Uh, and these, these nine subjects still form the core part of the LSE curriculum now. The names have changed somewhat, uh, but, but economics, statistics, co commerce, commercial geography, commercial history, commercial and industrial law, currency and banking, taxation and finance, and political science. So uh, this is all available online if you want to uh, have a look in more detail, but I thought I'd just share some pictures in the slides here. So apologies if that's a bit small. And the library was formed one year later in 1896. And uh, this is the original recommendation for the establishment of LSE Library. Uh, and this, uh, I think, came from uh, Beatrice Webb was one of the, the co-authors. But what it does, it states the need for the library of the, the serious study of political science and public administration, um, because it was particularly felt by the school's founders that the rest of Western Europe and, and the US were, were way ahead of the UK in terms of um, the serious study of, of social and political science. Uh, and the formation of the LSE the previous year really drove the urgency for such a library that wouldn't just support the activities at the university, but would support basically the national debate and national research being undertaken into the social sciences. Uh, the trustee the, of, of the BLPES, as we're also known as, that came out this year, has, has this kind of um, grand statement for what we're trying to achieve. Um, so, so in terms of uh, our, our collections since, ever since 1896, uh, as I mentioned, we've, we've, we've kind of got that dual purpose um, of being both a national library for the social sciences, but also as a working university library. And it's always been our, our slightly modest aim to be the world's greatest social sciences library. Uh, and the way our collections have, have developed has partly been through the connections of our founders and the generosity of individuals and organizations. And that really led the, the rapid development of our collections from basically a, a very much a, a starting point in 1896. Uh, we're lucky that because of the, the, the prominence and the reputation of our founders, they had connections across the world who, who enabled us to, to develop collections of an international scope quite quickly. Um, and because we have that dual purpose as both a university library and a national library, uh, I've, I think we've really taken the onus that we should develop collections with breadth and depth, but also that are very outward looking. Um, our collections also have an interdisciplinary aspect because LSE is really, the LSE curriculum and research has really been focused on interdisciplinary study. And the LSE has also taken that role in terms of driving and spearheading uh, the study of the social sciences within the UK. Um, but at the same time, I think we realised that despite active collection development efforts, uh, a lot of collection development happens through that mixture of design, but also that mixture of serendipity as well. Uh, basically, it happens accidentally. Uh, we want to be a world-class international social sciences library with the most diver diverse collections that we can acquire, uh, develop. But at the same time, circumstances, good fortune, just connections, knowing the right people have contributed just as much as the strategy. Um, if you're really interested in, the, in an overview of the LSE collections over the last uh, 125 years, uh, my predecessor, uh, Graham Canfield, wrote a history of those collections. And they will. Uh, there is a link to it in the references, um, but I'll make sure I share it in the chat afterwards. Um, so. That moves away from the history, but much more kind of taking a slightly more kind of contemporary perspective now. Um, so between 2016 and 18, uh, we undertook a collection evaluation project. Uh, and it's it's a project that we've we've spoken about at a couple of conferences, myself and Anna Towson, one of my colleagues. And it was the first collection evaluation that we'd conducted at such a scale. Uh, collection evaluations are work that you really have to undertake knowing what is ahead of you. It's usually a comprehensive project that takes several months, if not years. Um, but the purpose of this for us was to assess the value and significance of our collections. Uh, those collections had been expanding at great speed for over 120 years, and we'd never really kind of gotten a grip on what was in those collections or trying to look at it holistically or, or try to group our collections by theme. So we undertook that between 2016 and 18. And what we did was that we assessed our collections according to the subject matter of them, the quality, the research value, 
and we assigned one of uh, four uh, categories to them, flagship, heritage, current research and teaching, and low priority. And this was really like an amendment from some of the, the well-known categories that have been used in, in uh, collection assessments uh, within the UK and beyond. Uh, and what we found out about our collections at the end of the evaluation is that our flagship collections, so they're the most important collections, the ones that have the greatest level of subject matter, quality and research value, were two collections really. The first is kind of that, that bigger holistic set of collections on 19th and 20th century British political and economic history. That includes women's equality and rights, LGBT plus equality and rights, peace and internationalism, Britain's uh, relationship with the EU, the development of left-wing thinking, and poverty and welfare. Uh, so that's quite a broad uh, encompassing of, of all aspects of British um, political and economic history and social sciences. But also more broadly, the, the history of the social science, so particularly the school's archives uh, and the, the papers associated with some of the prominent uh, members of the school who contributed to development of social sciences. So at that point, we, we could probably pat ourselves collectively on the back and, and uh, be proud of the fact that we, we, we have acquired and developed these really extensive social sciences collections. But at the same time, we know what those strengths are, but we also realized that we had significant gaps in our collections, particularly in terms of the international social sciences. And really that our main focus is on a lot of domestic collections, but we could do more to, to look more externally as well. Um, so another thing that we did after that was do a slightly more deep dive uh, into our collections. Just take a bit more of a look into them and have a look at what information we could find out about those collections and just how diverse they were. So we did some data analysis using our library management system. So we use uh, Alma by Ex Libris. Um, so I, I can talk about the work that we did from an Alma perspective. Um, other library management systems are available and may have other um, functions that Alma doesn't have or vice versa. So uh, I'm sure with any LMS, you'll be able to, to do some degree of data analysis, but it may differ from what Alma can do. Um, so we looked at data in Alma to look at the, ge the geographical division of our collections. Basically, where are those titles published? Um, now the caveat to this and what we've, we were fully aware of that we, we accept that this only tells us so much about the collections where they're published. Uh, it doesn't tell you other things about say the authors of those titles and their backgrounds and so on. All we can find out is the publication information and where those books are published. So even though that, that data is to some degree quite limited, it does give us a starting point to look at diversity and a point where we can kind of jump off and do a bit more qualitative analysis if we want to. Um, so we looked at the division uh, between titles published in the Global North and the Global South. And um, the, the big caveat I, had, I, I add here is that this is very contentious terminology. The definitions of the Global South and Global North have been debated and challenged and the boundaries are ever shifting and evolving. So what we did is that we used the Wikimedia classifications uh, as, as part of our observing the composition of our collections, but that is not us endorsing the Wikimedia uh, definition, nor a suggestion that they are the most correct ones. Um, now, according to the Wikimedia categorizations, and if you, if you, if you search on Wikimedia, you, you'll be able to find out the, the exact um, division between the Global South and the Global North, but the Global North comprises 65 countries primarily uh, Europe, North America, and some of some of the countries in the Asia and Pacific region. The Global South comprises 182 countries, so that's mostly the remaining countries in the Asia Pacific region, South and Latin America, Africa, uh, the Arab states, and a few in Europe. So that's really about a 75%, 25% breakdown between the Global South and the Global North uh, in terms of the, the countries of the world. Um, so what we did is that we looked at our two main print collections at LSE and what we did, we, we obtained the, the data on where those titles were published and then had a look at what the breakdown between global, the Global North and the Global South was. Um, and these were figures that were, were quite revealing. Maybe we, we should have expected those, but, but it kind of makes a, a real kind of 
stark breakdown. So in terms of the course collection, so the course collection is basically the teaching collection at LSE. So they are the short loan titles that are primarily used for teaching and those that are used on reading lists. And what we found is just under 98.5% of those uh, are published in global north countries. So that is primarily uh, the UK and US. Um, and that we found just under 93% of those of uh, the main collection. Uh, so they are broader social sciences titles, usually background on uh, reading lists, but usually primarily um, used for research, also published in the global north. So that is a huge, huge majority of titles from both collections published in the global north. Um, so just folks on the, on the course collection said it was just under 98.5%. Uh, and of those, about 95% are published just in the UK and the US. So, so from our teaching collections, it is really primarily published in two countries. Uh, the other global North countries, as, as small as the representation is, is mostly Western Europe and, and North America. So, so Canada, for example. Um, a small number of course collection titles are published in the Global South, but the majority of those are published in India. Um, India is actually the fourth largest country for course collection titles uh, completely, actually. Um, but other Global South countries are in the course collection titles, like South Africa and China, are, are very much a long way back. It's, it's almost single figures of titles, really. Um, and of the 182 Global South countries, only 34 um, countries are actually in our teaching collections. Um, the Global South is, is generally better represented in the, in the main collections, um, and that reflects its, its purpose as a wider research-focused set of collections. Um, but it's still, as, as you can see, heavily, heavily dominated by the Global North. Um, but what is interesting about the main collection, and I'll have some graphs to show you in a minute just to illustrate this, is that the main collection is actually much, much less dominated by just the UK and the US. So even though it's still just shy of 93% from the Global North, only about half of the main collection is actually published just in the UK or the US. So that's, that's quite a big fall from the course collection. Um, so there's greater representation from, say, Western Europe, Canada and Australia, for instance. So, so our, our main collections have a lot of Western European languages, uh, titles in the social sciences, for instance. Um, in terms of the main collection, again, India is the largest global South country, but there tends to be a, a slightly larger distribution of global South countries in our, in our main collections. So 148 of the 182 global South collections uh, countries are represented in those collections. So that's, that's, again, the numbers, the numbers will, well, the numbers of countries only reveal so much about the diversity, really, but there are many, many, many more Global South countries uh, represented in the main collections. So, for instance, Latin and South America are countries are much, are much better represented in the main collections than, say, Africa and Asia. <clears throat> and we thought about why this might be, and we did have an active collecting policy for Latin and South America for many, many years. But I think because of the, the reciprocal relationship with historic, we've historically had with SOAS, um, we sought, both libraries to sort of kind of maintain uh, specialist social sciences collections and avoid duplication and overlapping collections. So I think some of our weaknesses in, in Asia and Africa in particular may just reflect the, the, the unofficial agreements we've, we've held with SOAS. Um, that doesn't mean that, that that's a reason just to maintain those weaknesses. I think there's definitely more we can do there. But that may explain some of the, the historical context why Africa and Asia is less well represented than uh, South and Latin America, for instance. So in previous presentations I've done in this, I've often overwhelmed people with graphs, but I'll only include two this time. So in terms of the course collection titles, again, as I said before, it is, it is 95 and 98.5% dominated by global North countries. And even then the UK and US make up about 95% of those collections. So you'll see after the UK and the US in the course collection, it is a significant drop off after that. Uh, you can see, if you tilt your head to see the axis, you can see India in fourth place and then South Africa and China quite a long way back. But otherwise it is dominated by the UK, US and some Western European countries. And then with the main collection, hopefully you'll see that that graph kind of slightly flattens a bit more. So even though it is UK and US dominated, it isn't quite so stark. But again, the 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 leading countries after that all tend to be Western Europe or Global North countries. And there are um, India is still there from the global south and some of the South and Latin American countries. 
So even though with the main collection, there's that kind of greater disbursement of countries, let's say, um, it is still primarily dominated by uh, global north countries. So moving away from, from our kind of in, internal collection evaluations and so on, now I'm just going to start thinking more about some of the, the more philosophical issues about collections, really. Um, and this is where I provocatively entitle it, are, are library collections biased? And I'm sure most people's immediate trigger response is no, but but it's something that's worth delving into more. So, so li librarians are generally reflecting on collection development strategies more and more now particularly in terms of seeing whether they're compatible with their EDI goals or ambitions. Um, really for us, it's, it's a chance for us to pause and reflect and think about the nature of our libraries um, and the values and significance of our collections, which I don't think we probably do enough. So sometimes we have to kind of pause and ask ourselves fairly uncomfortable questions. Uh, and some of the authors that I, I cite here kind of pose some of those questions and um, the references at the end will uh, will point to those those authors, uh, articles or, or books, but they're well worth reading. Um, so uh, Morales and Olsenborg kind of raise concerns about the decision making uh, process in collection development. And they really ask whether librarians truly make objective and representative uh, decisions. Uh, the Quinn 2012 article talks about uh, whether decision making can be value neutral. Uh, and, and believes that that's, that's a mythic concept. Um, and Sadler and Borg argue that libraries basically have never been neutral repositories of, of knowledge. And what they do is just reflect uh, the values and structures of the, their parent institution. Uh, and that library collections have just historically developed in accordance with those values. So I think us as, as collection de development librarians may get a little bit nervous now as we think about this. And that we often believe that our collections have been developed by us to be fair and neutral, but that every collection is 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 biased in one way or another. Um, and I think accepting that is is possibly the the, the starting point to do something about it. Um, so uh, another another thing I did in the chapter was really think about things like cognitive bias and and how those those biases kind of make their way into the decision making uh, process if we are doing this actively. Uh, so I was reading some of the, the work by Daniel Kahneman and, and some of the biases that, that he talks about are things like anchoring bias. And anchoring bias is uh, an example in collection development of this would be if you have a collection development policy and you just rigidly stick to it and you follow that criteria to the letter to select resources and that you're using the collection development policy as your crutch in that, in that sense. Um, Another cognitive bias might be status quo bias, and that's where you you basically you know the strengths of your library's collection, and you just further develop those collections in accordance with those strengths rather than addressing the weaknesses. Um, then you have something like automation bias, which is using data-driven models of selection because you just think that will that will redress any biases. But as I'll talk talk about in a moment, there are definitely issues to consider there. And then something like selection bias is when it's almost the opposite of the status quo bias, actually, it's it's when you become aware of a weakness in your collections, and then you basically give that a lot of magnitude, and then you basically focus all your efforts on addressing the weaknesses. Um, now, as you probably might have thought with some of those cognitive biases, they actually overlap and contradict each other. Um, so what we probably need to think about is, is reflect on first how biases affect our decision making. Um, and in our pursuit of developing fair, what we perceive to be fair and neutral collections, our decision making actually may just reinforce uh, the pre existing inequalities that our collections embody. So, what we might have to think about doing is becoming more proactive, um, more interventionist, and ensure that marginalized and underrepresented groups gain more representation and prominence in our collections. Um, and I mentioned a point at the bottom about the research and publishing ecosystem and, and for colleagues who, who work in this area of collections, I, I think it's it's fairly clear that there are huge inequities in, in knowledge production and access to knowledge, um, and that many of our libraries' uh, collections budgets and, and collections decisions are, are swallowed by a small number of uh, publishers who, who really limit what we, we can have access to. So again, I think in terms of collection development, we also have to be aware that 
the publishing the research and publishing ecosystem is is stacked in the favor of certain people and there are groups and, and countries and publishers who are who are marginalized by that as well so i just wanted to uh, touch on a bit about the the relationship between library collections uh, and reading lists um, and reading lists themselves i think everyone would probably agree that reading lists are a reflection and a representation of their curriculum uh, they shape how students learn and they shape how students understand subjects and at reading lists that comprise uh, a narrow uh, number of authors or a number, uh, a narrow range of perspectives will really uh, impact how students learn or how students understand the topic. Um, and much like uh, like with collections, you know, uh, people who develop reading lists may do so with the, the most benign of intentions. Um, but reading lists themselves have authority and power, and I don't think people think about this uh, enough. So. You know why are certain titles or individuals excluded and some are included and that can't be a neutral process um the same the same biases that we talked about in terms of how our collections develop may ex may appear in how reading lists uh, uh, are created as well and again that reinforces uh, pre-existing inequalities um so there are examples uh, and they'll be in the references as well but also you'll read this in more detail in the book about bias within reading lists and that's that's at discipline level but also widely across uh, the academic spectrum so a couple of examples that i pointed out at discipline level is is in the politics and international uh, relations field um so the two articles cited there shows where where marginalization happens at both gender uh, and race um and politics and international relations is is not um alone in this basically most most disciplines uh, i think there will be evidence to show that marginalization happens depending on certain demographics um the example i, I gave here on african studies from the africa lsc blog uh was an exercise undertaken comparing the reading lists um at African universities and non-African universities on African studies. And you wouldn't be surprised to hear that uh, there was greater representation of African authors on the African reading lists about African studies than there are at uh, non-African universities. So in the African universities, about 15% of items on their reading lists were by African scholars. Uh, in the UK, it was 2%, um, so a huge, huge difference. Um, and a more recent article by, uh, Shukan Bird and Pittman, which came out of UCL, I think, looked at basically the, the science and the social sciences reading lists. So looking across the whole academic spectrum. And they discovered um, basically an empirical basis for concerns about uh, the, the reading lists and that they are dominated by white male Eurocentric authors. So it really happens across the academic spectrum. And it wouldn't be fair to suggest it just happens within certain disciplines. Um, Kind of in a in a broader context in terms of, of how universities operate um he is is much more globalized now um you know our, our university side are, are very very diverse now in the uk in particular and there's movement of people across the world to, to study at uk universities and that has a that has an impact on um our curricula and people are rightly asking questions about our curricula and how representative it is of the, of the university and the student body and whether those reading lists and a curricula reinforce inequalities and whether it advantages or disadvantages certain groups. Um, then we bring it kind of slightly back to full circle about uh, library collections and reading lists and basically what the relationship is and, and that they have a, a, a symbiotic relationship in many ways. Neither drives the other, they're, they're kind of always working in a, in, a, in a bit of a circular process. So um, we we know that the, the, the main purpose of collection development is to support teaching and research. Um, but equally, many academic staff design their curricula and develop their reading list based on what library collections comprise of. Um, so if, if we work with academic departments and we look at reading lists and you know, we, we make suggestions about how, how undiverse those reading lists are, the obvious retort will be is that well the collections aren't diverse um, so to avoid those kind of discussions i think it's really important for libraries to be ahead of the curve not wait to be challenged about 
about the diversity of our collections, but to to reflect on our processes and and think of ways to support greater diversity for reading lists and partner with academic staff where possible to shape the curricula. So I think there's a really big opportunity here for us to be proactive. So uh, at, the, at the end of my chapter, really what I do is, is, and this will be the last part of the presentation, is to focus on some of the practical recommendations that libraries can follow. Um, and if, if they're keen on engaging with decolonizing collections, some will be quick and simple, some will be more complex. You may pick and choose things here depending on what interests you uh, and what time resources you have. Um, so there's nine here, but I'll go I'll go through them pretty quickly. Um, so the first one is is basically actively commit to supporting EDI and collection development. Um, it may not be enough to to commit to a neutral approach to collection development. Um, there's enough subjective bias in our decision making that suggests that neutra neutrality is never achievable anyway. But also, is neutrality even 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 the ideal here? Does neutrality just reinforce some inequalities? Do we have to go further than being neutral? Uh, and do we have to be more assertive in addressing inequalities in our collections? Uh, but another way to support EDI is to work with EDI colleagues across institutions. Most universities will have an EDI office aligned with institutional strategies on EDI, uh, for instance. Um, in terms of having a fit for purpose collections policy, collections policy they provide us with guidance, strategic direction, but they are normally inflexible, unresponsive to change. Um, there's there's one article I read that that really kind of suggests that collections policies, you know, they get written, they end up in the the virtual uh, drawer and only come out again ten years later. The main thing is that collections policies are living, dynamic documents that change when the situations change. Uh, so at the LSE, we revised our collections policy. In about 2019, I think, but we liaised with our EDI colleagues uh, and we used uh, an equality impact assessment framework to do that. So we were um, uh, using the the, the the institutional tools that our EDI office had to do that. Uh, and we took a pretty clean slate approach. We didn't just retain 90% and just add some things in. We, we took a real clean slate approach. Um, and we really thought about where did the current policy not promote equality? Where did it perhaps indirectly discriminate? Um, so now what we do is place a lot more emphasis on supporting EDI and decolonization of the curricula in it. And it's a much more balanced policy than the previous one. In terms of supporting staff to diversify reading lists, um, at the LSE, we, we don't have a, an institutional mandate on um, decolonizing or diversifying curricula. It very much happens at a uh, departmental level. It's a bottom-up approach. Uh, and at LSE, we're, we're ready and, and happy to support departments. And we've done this already. Uh, so we've done it with public policy uh, and law, I think, in terms of supporting those departments with their bottom-up initiatives. Uh, and then what we realize is that we talked about some of the data that we can provide, and that's really a starting point, a jumping off point for them to do some more detailed analysis. Um, but another good thing is, is not as much as the data, but really it's the connecting people across the school. So what we find is that we know departments are doing this work in isolation, but they don't know they're doing it in isolation. Or the, or the teaching learning center, you know, maybe able to support this work, but they don't know what's happening in departments. So in many ways, as liaison librarians, one of our roles here might just be joining dots up across the institution. In terms of more practical sense, uh, seeking out new publishers and suppliers. Um, mostly in universities, we're, we're purchasing material based on uh, consortia frameworks. And what that does, it risks squeezing out smaller publishers or academic publishers uh, from outside of those, those, those frameworks. Um, but what that means is that we're potentially neglecting Global South scholarship and research making sure it, it stays marginalized in our collections. So I think what we, we might need to do is, is look at smaller scale specialist publishers uh, and, and actively acquiring material from, from there, even though there are potential challenges with that. So, so things like invoicing, cataloging, records delivery, and so on. But sometimes we may just have to swallow up those inconveniences in terms of uh, making our collections more, more diverse and, and act in, in order to, so that we can actively acquire from those, from those smaller publishers. 
in terms of collaborative collection development, it's really important that we we include more, uh, you know, more uh, experiences and voices in in our collection development work rather than it just being the sole preserve of a small number of librarians. Um, we probably tried doing this, tried to get more people involved in our collection development through patron driven uh, acquisitions. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't treat that as the 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 the, the panacea to, to to fix that problems really, because what we're doing then is relying on systems to sort those issues out, and they have their own sets of biases themselves. Um, the good thing about having a collective approach to collection development is that you you develop a sense of shared ownership in collections. Um, so, as I mentioned before, what we can do is collectively write collections policies and and work with the working groups across the university to do that. Um, in terms of improving discoverability and addressing bias, um, do we know enough about how library systems work um, and which biases you know are reflected in? search results when somebody search on the, searches on an ebook platform or searches on their the library catalog there's a lot of research about gender and racial bias in search engines um you know there's the case of tim nick gebru who's the, the google researcher who was fired for exposing um uh gender and racial bias in in google image results um and there's it's also suggestions that library systems may have their own biases towards minorities as well um there's the case of, um, if anyone's seen the Change the Subject documentary, is the case about the term illegal aliens in the Library of Congress as well, and uh, and that taking place in a very heightened political situation in the US, and how change was basically impossible to achieve because um, Congress was incredibly intransigent about it. Um, so I think librarians are taking matters into their own hands more, being proactive in terms of uh, addressing discoverability uh, issues and bias. So these may be things like cultural sensitivity messages and so on. Um, in terms of ring fencing collections for retention, uh, generally libraries make uh, retention issues based on quantitative data, but that just risks turning retention into a popularity contest, really. What it risks doing is uh, is more niche specialist material will then be marginalised, but actually that has a lot of value. Uh, so I think you need to take a more balanced approach to retention. In some cases, just ring fence certain collections if they're not held in other institutions, if they're rare, if they have a, a focus on a particular part of the world or a particular subject that isn't uh, available elsewhere. So it's just taking that more balanced approach. Uh, reviewing and assessing collections. So I talked a bit about the collection evaluation work that we've done at the LSE, but it's definitely worth thinking about whether that's applicable at your own institution. It doesn't have to be to a huge scale particularly, um, but I think getting a sense of what your collection strengths and weaknesses are, and then developing the, the strategies that you might want to put in place to address those. And lastly, um, it's really us as, as colleagues working in this area to speak to each other and to share experiences and to inspire each other and give us give each other ideas for where to start because some of us work on projects in, in isolation we don't necessarily know where to start them we don't necessarily know what other people are doing so it's important that that we share our experiences through talks like this or other conferences or well, we had a on the uh decolonization gisc mail list uh there was a google sheet go around where people could put on projects they're working on so at least you have a named contact for who you want to speak to going forward um so that's a lot of ideas. You won't need to do them all necessarily, um, but they're just things that you might want to think about and some practical ideas. Uh, if you do want to um, uh, diversify your collections or, or, or kind of do outreach across your own institution. I think that's me. I'm glad I didn't time this because I think I ran much over. Um, in terms of references, there's a few references here, but I, I wouldn't worry about seeing these in, in real time. Um, some of them are available on our race and diversity reading list, uh, but I've also set up a Zotero group where you can access uh, these references, but also um, they're all in the um, the book chapter as well. So I think that's me done. And thank you, Kevin. Um, there you go, Joanne as well. So we've got a good number of questions in. I'm going to take them from the top. So we're going to go back to Joanne's talk first off. Um, specific one for you. Are you keeping a separate record of which terms 
are removed or changed from archival records? Um, it's not a separate record, it's in our collections management system, so we, we can pull reports off of what's been done there. Yeah. Well, great, excellent. Um, and then one, one for both of you, really. I mean, Joanne, you mentioned getting buy-in being a challenge. What strategies mm -hmm. and approaches have you employed to help get people on board? Um, a lot of it is about building relationships with people. I think this isn't just a, it's not just a library activity. It's not just a lot, and it's not just a project either. This is a real pivoting of activity and changing of working practices that um, I think takes a lot, a lot of building trust with people and, um, and helping people to adapt their work in practice as well. So um, I think we've still got a lot more work to do on that. Um, you know, it's, it's an iterative process really yeah. that we're going through. Kevin, anything to? Yeah, I th in terms of buy-in, I, I don't think buy-in at the library level has been, been much of a problem. I think we've been very much supported by the library senior management and, and colleagues across the library. Um, in terms of it, at school level, as, as I mentioned, LSE doesn't have a top-down mandate on reviewing curricula or there isn't a, a drive to diversify the curricula across the board, but it's working with the departments that we know are doing this. And it is, it's very much a bottom-up initiative. And we know there are, say, half a dozen departments who are doing this work. And really, it's the best that we can do to support them. And then hopefully that the, the good practice that develops then kind of just feeds across the school and then becomes um, almost like a school-wide project from the bottom up. Excellent. Um, Joanne, another one for you, um, and particularly probably you. Uh, what support is available to staff who are engaged in the work you're describing? They will encounter depictions and language that they find upsetting or thinking of the Sinti and Romani collections situations and events are upsetting. Um, it's from Keith Knuckles at Leicester, and he says, we've talked a bit, this a bit at Leicester, interested to see what others are doing. Yeah, I think it's, it is really hard um, what we're tackling. And um, I think with the um, particular um, Romani work that's gone on, I know that the staff team have been supporting each other, thinking through, you know, talking about what they're seeing and um, reflecting on it preparing themselves for some of these encounters that they're going to have and giving themselves time again to, you know, just get away from that space that they've been working in, go and get a coffee, debrief about what they, they're doing. So um, just giving each other time and acknowledging the emotional um, labour of the work as well, I think is, has been our starting point. But I'm sure there are many people probably on the call as well that um, would have ideas Excellent. Uh, James, um, one, if I could, yeah, go and go for it, I, yeah, I, mean, yeah, go. I, I don't have an archives and special collections background, but <clears throat> but in terms of, say, exhibitions work that we've done recently, we, we recently, I think it may have been the centenary of uh, um, Malinowski's time at the LSE. Malinowski is, is one of the originators of anthropology as, as, as we know it now, but he has a fairly contested legacy, let's say, uh, and in our exhibition on on, on him, I think we were very upfront in suggesting, you know, his his legacy at the LSE is not, uh, you know, a hundred percent rosy picture. That there are challenges there, and I think, um, and, and then maybe archivist colleagues here from the LSE on the call. But um, I think we were very clear that, uh, you know, there would be challenging topics that we're raising here. Um, but it's it's our job to confront them and not pretend they don't exist. Yeah, I think um, with with dealing with some of those really sensitive issues with communities, I think having relationships with people that have already got the trust of those communities as well is really important. And I think that being able to speak with people who are experts in particular areas or have got those community relationships has really helped the team in their approach to tackling some yeah. of those yeah, traumatic I'd, collections. Yeah, I was particularly struck by a phrase you used a couple of times, which was experts and knowledgeable people and mm -hmm. kind of widening out the sense of who has knowledge and expertise beyond mm -hmm. yeah, just talking to our own academics. Um, another question, actually, this is about our academics. Um, so as 
particular element for you, John, and then probably for both of you. So the question is, what is your experience of working with academic staff on this project? Do they recognise the importance of the skills that special collection staff bring to the table? And I suppose we could widen that out, Kevin, to, to library staff in general. That's probably, a, that's probably a whole webinar on that, but yeah, do your quick bit on that. Well, I think um, I'd say that, yes, I think academics do um, appreciate what the library's doing in this area. I think um, how how much they've been involved in um, some of those specifics in terms of how we've tackled the offensive language so far, um, I, I'm not sure of that, but it is something that we want to keep going back to them through the advisory board that we've got. But I think um, for us, we're, we're, we're a small cog in much a, bigger ecosystem of activity that's needing to go on around the university on this and um, so I, I think it's all about collaboration and coordination recognizing each other's skills and knowledge across the university and and understanding that every all the stakeholders have got a different kind of investment in this as well yeah uh, I, I think from our point of view in terms of the departments that we supported with with looking at their reading lists um usually the departments have approached us because uh, i think they've realized that <clears throat> we're able to provide the data about the reading list uh at least data that would allow them to to be slightly ahead of if they'd done it manually um but again it's it's waiting for departments to, to come to us because there isn't a school-wide mandate or you, you might be slightly worried that you're treading on toes um but I think what we hope is where we have a few examples of good practice that that just kind of starts a groundswell of um, kind of enthusiasm in it. Um, but yeah, I, th I think one thing that's, that I always try to remember is that you kind of have to always think slightly modestly about how much progress you can make. Because um, without a mandate at your institution, it's, it's only going to happen in, in incrementally. So we'll we'll segue beauty from um, expertise within the university to a question about how can librarians from other sectors, e.g. corporate, special libraries, law, help with decolonisation efforts for academics, librarians more generally? I think when I, I mean, when I was, when I was looking at the, the discipline level <laughs> issues about diversity and reading lists, actually law was one of the, the departments that jumped out is that there's a lot of actually research into into law as a discipline that that famously probably isn't very diverse um i mean i suppose i suppose for universities we're, we're in a strong position because i think there is there is at most of our institutions there is some interest in in the curriculum diversifying it in terms of specialist libraries i imagine that's the hardest challenge um and i wouldn't know what to recommend really apart from start small and, and build on the, the the successes that you have um because inevitably it will be more difficult than than making progress in an academic library joanne anything to add um maybe there are still events co coming to things like this being part of the conversation and helping with that collaborative effort really you know um, I'm sure that in these different types of institutions that have got libraries, they'll still have their own kind of um, challenges around EDI and, um, you know, the, there must be ways that the libraries can contribute to their organisations more broadly. Excellent. Um, Kevin, one for you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about, have you done any research or critical analysis into the relation of diverse reading lists and impact with students and the attainment gap between black asian and marginalized ethnicities um so um, it, not 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 me personally but there is certainly uh, an awareness uh, at the lse in terms of attainment gaps um and if i knew this question was coming i would have <laughs> I'd looked up the exact strategy that the, the university is taking uh i think it's called an inclusive action plan i think that's what it's called so apologies if i literally just google as i'm talking to you uh but our, our teaching and learning center uh, uh, have a project called the inclusive education action plan and i think what that is looking at is uh basically how structures within a university uh advantage you know already advantage groups um that hasn't so in many ways those the things that that's looking at are not necessarily 
kind of at, at, at our level just yet. Uh, but certainly, so it's looking at things like academic mentoring and inclusive pedagogy. So it doesn't quite come to library collections or reading lists at this point, but certainly there's scope for us to piggyback onto that to some extent. Um, so I think there is a role for us there, uh, but I think some of the issues about uh, attainment gap and so on may need bigger structural changes first, but that isn't to say that we can't be involved somewhere. Yeah. And if anybody does know of any research on reading lists and attainment gap, then please, you know, post it in the chat. Um, and then um, question from Grizel, which says, is there a similar list available online regarding acceptable words regarding inclusive terminology? Now, there was the, the link posted at the top. Um, I think was that to Carissa Chu's inclusive terminology glossary yeah. which i'd mentioned i'm i'm not sure i don't know about others but it might be something that um rl uk colleagues or other people on the call might know about yeah again one of the, one of the strong things about these webinars is the chance for everybody to chip in what they know so if you do know please stick it in the chat um another question um which is about academic buy-in and this is around reading list but i'd be interested joanne around you know academic use of special collections as well so the particular question is about you know it is kind of the materials that go into making up reading lists and the the, the range of materials and the question is how have you approached buy-in from the academics so their reading lists are fundamentally changed rather than just adding a few diverse sources and non-essential texts and i suppose the, the special collections version of that question is, you know, how has how has your work changed academic teaching as well as reflecting academic teaching, Joanne? So, yeah, Kevin, do you want to talk about diverse sources? And Joanne, I'll give you a little minute to. Yeah, I, I, it's a topic that would make me quite nervous in terms of approaching academics and in directing them on how they should uh, develop their reading list. I think I think I think one of the things I mentioned is is. <laughs> Um, if, if, if whatever judgments we make about the diversity of reading lists, I think the inevitable answer is that, like, you know, you, I, academics can only work with the materials you provide them with. Um, so that's why I, I said it was really important for us to be proactive and, and stay ahead of those discussions, really, and, and try to make efforts to, to make our collections more diverse before those discussions happen. Um, I think we know there are certain disciplines where supporting more diverse uh, reading lists is easier. It may be, you know, subjects like, um, you know, international relations or development studies and so on. Um, so I think for us, it's it's probably getting a sense of how welcome our interventions might be, first of all. Um, but I think it's really just looking for where those opportunities are to flag things up. So if we purchase new resources, and at LSE, we're quite active in purchasing new primary sources or collections that have a more global uh, perspective, just you know, using those as a starting point to start a discussion and then saying, oh, well, maybe you, know, you might want to think about including these in your reading list, or maybe there are some other sources you might want to include. So you know, a bull in a china shop approach is probably not gonna work here, but I think it's just starting small, leveraging those wins and, and then having uh, bigger discussions. But I think, um, I think, I think once academics see what you can do for them, I think there is certainly, it's certainly a starting point to make progress. But yeah, generally I, I get very nervous about the idea of telling academics what to do. Uh, and Joanne, do, do you tell yeah. them what to do? Oh, all the time. <laughs> no, um, I think um, there's real opportunity for partnership with researchers here and um, we, I think we are quite um, at the start of a journey here still, really, but we've got a real opportunity to make collections discoverable that might have been um, not prioritised in the past and to, to think about different relationships with different groups of um, researchers that might not even, even known there was anything that would have been relevant to them in the past. Um, I think it gives lots of opportunities for thinking about different modules that we could be teaching with, um, curation of collections, interpretation, 
lots of student opportunities as well. So I, I think it, it, it just opens a new conversation, really. Yeah, that's true. Um, so we're, we're heading towards the end. Um, there's no more questions. I've got one last question um, for both of you, which is we've talked about collaboration. And yeah, and this is an RL UK webinar. So my question would be, what would the one collaborative sector thing be that you'd like to see happen to really push forward decolonizing the role of research libraries? First one with an answer, shout it. <laughs> no, I think I, I mean, certainly I think for the last, let's say five years, I, I, th I think a lot of, of a lot of university libraries have done a lot of work in this area. I think what, what we found in the, the, the number of conferences and events that have happened since maybe about 2018 is that there are a lot of libraries doing work in this area. And, uh, and I mentioned about the, the decolonization GISC mail list and, and the Google sheet that we developed as part of that. It's really how do we kind of bring it together in terms of as a, a learning tool or, or something where we can, we can collaborate together on you know, pan institutional projects, or just making sure that if one of us wants to do some work in a certain area, they know who to speak to to get some ideas. We're not we're not having to start from scratch each time. Um, so I think it's probably a coordination issue more than um, you know we're all we're all starting from scratch because I, I don't think we are. I think we are all working on projects, and it's just how do we best kind of harness that collaboratively mm -hmm. um, to to then. To, achieve greater results across our institutions but the enthusiasm's there and I think people are working on this it's as I said it's probably more more a coordination issue yeah and I I think um it's coordination and and also looking from outside ourselves as well um there's lots of um of different community groups and different sector groups that we can carry on learning from um yeah we're we're not in it by ourselves are we I think that's an excellent note to finish on. <laughs> <laughs>